this show is presented by The Advocates, theadvocates.com. Jake, if you had to go with one particular guy, who is the likely secondary Utah Jazz man that will be on this team in the future? Yeah, I mean, I think that the roster is full of these guys. I think that, you know, the roster, like, you know, you go on ESPN.com and look at the roster. I mean, let's just start naming names. Fontecchio, JTA, as they call him, you know, Chris Dunn, Agbaji. Like, there's all kinds of guys on this roster. I, I think Agbaji is the go-to for me. I mean, he's a secondary player, a role player that is turning into quite the, the 3 and D type guy um but you know this spurs game the other night was was frustrating for me you know obviously they win it comfortably you know but but the, you're down 20 at the half or whatever it was like it's a bad look and and i i'm watching this game and and i'm like dude like where does this team go mentally where where why is it that you're struggling to control the san antonio spurs why is it that you're struggling to play your game and to command this game. And that's really my thing today with the Utah Jazz. Like, I don't understand why it's so difficult. I look at this team, you know, you look at the minutes distribution once again, and I, and I know we talk about this a lot, but I really think it's an important point. Like, you have Akbaji and Chris Dunn coming off the bench for, you know, almost, what is that, 54 minutes combined. Like, that's a lot of minutes. And I, I'm cool with Akbaji. Two of five from three, you know, four of eight from, from the floor, plus 20. Like, he had a nice night, 100%. Chris Dunn, decent night. Not great, but decent. And I and I look at this box for the starters. Talon Horton Tucker, I, you know, I supported him last week. Uh, I struggled with him a little bit in this game. I thought he had a nice game, but there were a lot of, a, a lot of silly plays. Like, a lot of, hey, he should have finished this one at the rim and that didn't happen and that led to a bucket on the other end hey you know you didn't get initiated into your offensive set like you should have and that turned into a bucket on the other end and and i look at it and, and i'm saying you know we go from 31 minutes for tht to 24 minutes so i like the improvement but i just i want this team to really dial it in every night like i want Lori markinen to 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 not have you know these sort of vanilla performances like yeah he had 27 but i felt like for large swaths of the game he just wasn't a huge factor he wasn't that go-to guy that guy that we saw you know against memphis against you know some of the bigger games like i look at this roster and i say man there are a couple guys here that i'm really married to and the rest of these guys are expendable like i'm still obviously i'm still married to marketing i'm i'm you know i'm still married to walker kessler Ochai Agbaji, I'm absolutely married to. I need to see this guy in two, three years, you know, turn into what I think he can be, which is a 38 to 40% three-point shooter. I think he can turn into a really good defensive player who could play probably three positions. You know, the three is probably stretching his ability, but I think in certain matchups, he could play the three defensively. So that's why I say, like, this roster is shot full of guys who are secondary players. But for me, the real question is, what direction is this team going with Will Hardy? Because I don't love the fact that you were down 20 at the half against the worst team in the league. That's a bad look. Like, you should not be playing down to your competition. You should be up 20. You should be controlling this game. You should be firmly dominating this team. Yet, that wasn't the case. And, by the way, this was that same game where I had to listen on a crappy radio signal for the first call, and I could still tell, or for the first quarter, and I could still tell you were playing down your competition. So it just bothers me that we're we're sitting here having to talk about this team not dominating a team, and, and obviously you're going to get another shot, right? Like you're what? What I think tomorrow they're, night, they're tomorrow, a ten point yeah. favorite again, like right? Like you. So and you again, you win the game handily, but it's not really about the fact that you won the game. Now it's about the fact that you were down twenty, you win the game by uh, what sixteen because you have this outlandishly good second half. Like, I just want them to be more consistent overall. By the way, the Maverick Center tonight, which is where we do this show from every day, uh, I just got uh, accosted by security on my way back from the bathroom. Why? Uh, because there's a massive junior jazz event tonight. Okay, and well, the building is actually full. Okay, but why were you accosted by security? I have no idea. He's like, do you have a pass, sir? I'm like, no, man, I just, I'm doing my show downstairs. Got to go to the bathroom. Oh, what show is that? Hey, man, I, I, I got to go to the bathroom. Well, I'm going to need to figure out where you're coming from and where you're going to. Wow. <laughs> it's like, okay. Again, just a little old money over here. You know, but the point is, the building is full with kids and yeah. 
Jazz stuff and the uh, Salt Lake Stars are here tonight. So it's going to be an uh, interesting night there, friends. Uh, anyway, my point is I agree with you to an extent on the playing down to your competition thing. I am not fully on board with their ability to be motivated the entire season. I think that's asking an awful lot. And when I look at this Jazz team, when we talk about guys that should be here into the future, you know, beyond the Lori and Walker Kessler, I think my biggest question mark is Colin Sexton. Is he a guy that you're absolutely married to? And the answer is I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. If we're, you know, if we're if we're brass tacking it, Colin Sexton's going to be out a significant amount of time. And it does not look like he's going to be back in the next seven to ten days. So it's going to be interesting to see what his health looks like. I I just don't know if he's a long-term fit on this team. Where are you at on Colin Sexton, Jake? Yeah, I mean, I think he hasn't proven that he's a long-term fit. I think the injuries have really, you know, been trouble for him. I think that it's it's interesting that he's, you know, healthy enough to do a skills challenge but not healthy enough to play. And I know I know skills challenge is different than the whole game, but why are we running him through the skills challenge? Why? Why, why are we asking him to do more than rehab? I don't know. It's weird to me. Like, it's just odd. You couldn't find another guy to run the skills challenge. Like, come on, dude. And and I look at this and I just, I want, I don't know. I want him to be better. I want him to develop. But the injuries are really holding him back. You have to be consistently available or you're never going to turn into what you should turn into. This is why, you know, Lori being healthy for most of the year is a huge deal. This is why you're seeing him take strides. This is why Walker Kessler is taking big strides. You know, you're, you're seeing his game flourish in front of your eyes because he's been healthy he's had his moments he's gotten dunked on but he's also you know improved and taken the steps forward and done some dunking on and done some blocking and done some nice things so where am i at on colin sexton i think the guy's got to stay healthy when he's on the floor i think he's a plus player i do think there are times where i'd like him to rein it in a little bit but overall i think he's i think he is good for this unit that said if some team came calling tomorrow i would trade him i'd be happy to i'd be happy to look at his value and see what i could get back for that because i don't think he's the guy that's gonna be a point guard on your team when you're trying to win a championship that's that's the reality of the situation you're gonna need a better point guard if you want to win a championship yeah i would agree with that it's interesting you know watching mike conley mike's not nearly as effective in minnesota as he as he was here and it's really, it's crazy to think, you know, you look around the league at point guards, how many guys have gone through these, how many guys have gone through the Utah Jazz as a point guard? How many guys have been on the ball in Dallas? Think about the Clippers. Like, it's so funny to me the way the point guard position in this league has changed to the point where now it's almost becoming a turnstile kind of situation in a lot of cities around the league. Like you look at James Harden, James Harden's one of the elite point guards in the NBA Yet he's gone from Houston to Brooklyn to Philly. Might be going back to Houston. We don't know. But I think the point guard spot in this league has become an enigma with certain examples like Steph Curry, who's been a multi-time champion and a, and a stalwart for the dubs. But, Jake, I think the point guard position in the NBA has become a real struggle. Yeah, I mean, you obviously have different types of guys. I think that... You know, you have guys like Steph who are Hall of Famers right out the gate. You have guys like Chris Paul who want to be Hall of Famers but aren't. You've got guys who who really outshine their position, you know. Um, and then you have guys who are somewhere in between. And I think the reality is the minimum to win a championship at your point guard position is someone who understands who he's playing with and what to do with the ball. Like, that's that's your job as a point guard. Like, we've this league has turned point guards into scorers, and that's great. I'm happy to have it. But, uh, but like Reggie Jackson, I love Reggie Jackson because he knows when to give it up and he knows when to go and get his. And most guys just don't understand that, and that's the and challenge in it. And he's playing much better in Denver than he was in L.A. You know, like, it's, it's just interesting. As far as the Jazz go, like, I, Colin Sexton's dispensable. You know, but I, I look at, obviously, Ochai's not dispensable. Chris Dunn has been very intriguing to me. I, I told you when they, they picked him up, I was super excited about Chris Dunn coming to this team. Now, long-term, he's going to have to show that he can play it in the NBA and emotionally handle the NBA. But how are you not excited about Chris Dunn right now? Yeah, I mean, I think he's, I think he's you know, there's opportunity here, clearly. I think he had a nice night. I, like I said, I, I, I think that, you know, what, what does he have? I think he had 20 minutes or whatever he played. Like, he, he had a good game off, off the bench. But, I, I, yeah, 23 minutes, you know, 7 of 13 from the field, one three-pointer. You know, like, he was a plus player. Like, he had a nice night. I, and Absolutely. I think that, 
I think that, you know, I look at these Talon Horton Tucker minutes and I think those minutes go down and those go to Chris Dunn if Chris continues to play well. And and the Jazz are sorely in need of a point guard to run the offense. Because again, like I said, I think that the Jazz tend to get tend to sort of wander. They tend to get into these, you know, situations where they're just kind of playing monotonous basketball, which is how you find yourself down 15 or 20 to a team that shouldn't even be on the floor with you. Yeah, and I I wonder I wonder what Chris's long term developmental arc looks like uh, because I could see him being a, a three year guy. Like he can absolutely be a bench player on this team. I have no doubt about that. Um, I think he showed flashes of that in Chicago. We never really got the full piece or the full all of Chris Dunn on that team. But I don't think there's any reason that he can't become a really effective contributor for this Jazz team. Yeah. But other than that. I don't know who else would be here. Like Talon Horton Tucker is a guy that I feel like he's become a bit of a folk hero. And I want to understand why. Like why are Jazz fans attached to to Talon Horton Tucker? I don't see it. I don't understand it. Well, I think it's because he's physical. I, I think he's physical. Now he's got his shortcomings. I'm not saying that the guy is some amazing player. I do like THT. But it's got to be in limited runs. You can't have, like, even 24 minutes the other night, I think he had, you know, yeah, 24 minutes. Like, you 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 look at the five turnovers. Like, like Talon Horton Tucker is somebody who is a role player off the bench. And, and to me, if he comes in and he gives you 20 minutes a night, I yes. wouldn't run him out there anymore, but 20 yes. minutes a night, I think he can be effective. He's physical in, in 20 minutes. That's not overexposure. Like, once you start getting past that number, I think you're asking him to do too much, and some guys are just like that. So 20 minutes off the bench, I like THT. I'm curious. I am curious. Can Talon Horton Tucker get with a guy like a Chris Brickley and become a legitimate shooting threat in this league where he can knock down 33 to 35% of his threes? And can he become a guy that can, can finish at the rim? Because he can't do either right now, and I think it's absolutely crippling him. <laughs> And I think it's crippling his minutes on this team. He is, he is, I, I, I can't believe he is even top half in the league at finishing at the rim. Uh -huh. He is, he's just not a good finisher. And the, his mechanics are broke on the three point shot right now. Like I, I, that to me is the biggest of them. deal. He's not consistent, but he can make it in the corner. He can make it in certain situations, which is why I think Will Hardy runs him out there. Cause like, again, you just look at his stat line, like, Two of three from three. Not a lot of attempts, but he made two out of three. In the right situation, he'll make it. My question is, what happens when he shoots five threes in a game? Yeah, he shouldn't shoot five threes in a game because you know that percentage is going to go down. That That's exactly what I'm saying. I don't want this guy taking five, six, seven threes, certainly. Like, I want him taking three or two and then going out of the game. Like, come in, make a shot, make two shots, get to the line maybe because you're a physical guy, yes. and then come out of the game and then do it again for me. Like, that's what I'm looking for. But the problem is when Colin Sexton's hurt so damn much, you got to play THT more. That's why this Chris Dunn thing has – I'm optimistic about it. Again, I'm not going to get ahead of myself and say Chris Dunn is the savior off the bench. He needs to continue to prove oh, it. Oh, well, like, he's going to get a chance to get – he's going to get run. There, is, there's yeah. no doubt about that. He's shown you more than enough already – to justify giving him more minutes as the days go on. Yeah. I, I don't think there's any doubt about that. What's up, Greg Hawkins? Good to see you, my friend. Jacob DeLambo says, I wanted THT to be good, but I ain't batting uh, for him to stay. Well, I don't, I don't yeah. disagree with that. Yeah. Uh, Brett Burnett says, Conley hasn't really had a chance to play, but the Wolves making life miserable for their fans. There's a chance they're not a playoff team. <laughs> Honest to goodness, it's crazy to say it out loud. But Rudy's not playing for them. Carl Anthony Towns is still not playing for them. I, 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 how they went the other day, I was watching the game. Maybe it was last night. I think they went five straight trips and Anthony Edwards didn't touch the ball. How? With Mike Conley on the floor. I, that's what I say with marketing. How does that happen? How yeah. do you, like, how does that happen? Anthony Edwards, when, when Cat's out of the lineup and Delo's in LA, he's your number one. Even when those guys were there, he probably was your number one. Yeah. You know, and, and yet he goes these long stretches without touching the ball. And that's got to change. And I don't know how you change that. I don't know how you go about that. But that's got to change. Thanks. So I, I don't know. I think there's some real shocking results coming in the West. Yeah. Because I'm seeing some awfully nice work last night out of, out of Russell Westbrook. 
I think going to Denver and winning is incredibly difficult because they just run your ass off the floor. That's all Denver did last night. They just got up and down, and, and the Clippers ran out of gas at altitude. Yeah. And I think that's why the Jazz are such a tough out at home because they're just going to run you up and down the floor, and they have the lungs for it, and you don't. But I think the Clippers are going to become a real problem, and I have real reservations about Kyrie Irving and Luka Doncic playing together because mm. I don't know. My name is Luka. I watched every bounce of the basketball in that Laker game, and I have no idea how Dallas is going to go about winning games. They let you down. Because Kyrie at times looks hesitant, like, oh, God, I got to get the ball to Luka. Just like, oh, my God, I have to get the ball to Luka. But that turns it into like an awkward happening there all of a sudden. Yeah. And Luka just never passes the ball to anybody. Nah. And you're not now all of a sudden like Tim Hardaway Jr. is kind of falling out of the rotation there. Like, it's just weird all of a sudden in Dallas. And listen, America's favorite anti-Semite, in my opinion, is not going to be a guy that's going to be a difference maker for them. Yeah, please respect my privacy. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'd have a real tough time seeing him resigning. Yeah, next question. I I, I really would. I don't don't know. Yeah. I understand he's the best fourth quarter player and everybody wants to tell you that. What I'm telling you is that I don't care if he's a fourth quarter player. He's not the guy to play with with Luka Doncic. I just don't think he's a championship player. That's the problem. Right now, at this point in his career... I'm not ready to say he's not a championship player. I mean, Kyrie Irving is a hell of a basketball player. There's no doubt about that. Okay, the so problem is, I just I don't think that he is easy to play with. And I think one of the things that you have to have is you have to have a guy that's an alpha male on that team. And Luka Doncic is not beloved as a leader. And I think that's why he needed the Lakers more than the Lakers needed Kyrie. Yeah, the reason I say he's not a championship player is because you played with one of the best players in the world in Kevin Durant and couldn't figure it out. You played with LeBron, you won a ring. That was very early in your career, and things have changed. And you've never shown this ability to win on your own. You've never shown this ability to yeah. win without a Kevin Durant or a LeBron. Like, there's, there's just not... I don't know, man. Steph is one with and without Kevin Durant. So is it Steph or is it Kyrie? That's oh, my problem. It, it is. It's Kyrie. That's what I'm saying. He, I mean, he torched. Oh, I, I don't disagree with you on that. He torched Boston. Absolutely torched Brooklyn. There's no doubt about it. He was a problem with the anti-Semitism community thing, the Ramadan, the missing games, the injuries, yeah. the attitude, the that's, suspensions. That's why I say he's not a championship player. Like, But yeah, when, you're, when LeBron is the alpha male on your team, you have no choice but to comply. You have no choice but to do what has to be done. Keep it real. When Luca's the alpha on your team, nobody does what has to be done. Yeah. Because Luca doesn't want guys to improve. He wants to score. He wants to he wants to be the hero. And that doesn't work with guys like Kyrie. Yeah. It it just doesn't. All of our Utah Jazz and NBA talk on the Monty show is presented by our friends at Quick Quack Car Wash. Telling you, man, just got a new Jeep Grand Cherokee. Thrilled to have it. Cannot wait to take it through Quick Quack Car Wash. The storm that's coming in. Again, it's already been snowing. It is going to snow more the minute it stops snowing. I'm going to Quick Quack Car Wash. I'm getting my membership transferred from Klaus. The other thing we got to do is we got to name the car. I'm pretty sure it's Atwater, but I... (sighs) Hank or Voight is tough on the Hemi because my Grand Cherokee's got a V8 Hemi in it. I'm not sure. Could be Atwater. I don't know. Anyway, yeah, Hank, I think it's Hank. But we're going to take Hank to Quick Quack and run it through the tunnel. Cannot wait. I'll be in and out of there in five minutes. The people are friendly. The vacuums are free. The towels are free. Bring your kids because they've got great lights and soap and colors. And kids love going through the car wash at Quick Quack Car Wash. I'm telling you, it's everything that's good. And by the way, we want to because you guys obviously take care of the show. um, Scan this QR code and get yourself 50% off any wash. At Quick Quack Car Wash, 50% off any wash at Quick Quack Car Wash. All you got to do is scan this QR code, telling you, man, hook it up. They'll give you 50% off if you scan this QR code. Any wash you want, 50% off at Quick Quack Car Wash. Make sure you tell them you heard about it on the Monty Show. Um, Again, I will just say Quick Quack Car Wash, the best car wash in the business, the best car wash that I've been to. I'm a member there. I do not get my car wash for free at Quick Quack. I subscribe, and it's worth every single penny. All of our Utah Jazz talk, all of our NBA talk on the Monty Show is presented by our good friends 
at Quick Quack Car Wash. Make sure you tell them you heard about it on the Monty Show. Okay, so again, I ask you, we're watching in the background Philly and Miami go head to head. Yeah. Are you ready to stop slandering the Philadelphia 76ers? Did they Are beat you ready? Boston? They didn't. They got beat at the buzzer by Jason Tatum. <laughs> <laughs> Who was the better team that night? I, I, well, Boston was. No, they were not. They were not. What do you mean? I'm telling you, the Sixers are the better team. The Sixers in a seven-game series, I think, beat Boston. Yeah. Because the Sixers can compete defensively. That's what teams in the East cannot do with Boston. They cannot compete defensively. But what you're seeing now is a revitalized P.J. Tucker. You are seeing a bench. And I think when, when you look at guys like DeAnthony Melton, when you look at guys like James Harden playing pretty good defense, the other night uh -huh. against yeah, Jalen Brown, that. Yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. I'm telling you now, you're looking at an MVP candidate in Joel Embiid. I think the Sixers are on par with Boston now, and I haven't been able to say that this oh, year. I, I agree. They're on par. I think that it's, you know, you can't. The problem is, is that Boston has been to the NBA Finals. Boston's been deep, and I think that that's where I still give them a slight edge. But I'm, I'm definitely not sitting here saying that Philly isn't like, you know, level with them or something or right with them like i think that it's 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 really a matter of of controlling joel Embiid. like for boston I, that's where you have to figure out just how much you're going to allow joel Embiid to do and and yeah it's great to see james harden diving on the floor it's great to see you know them playing all out like it is and i think you know jason tatum got the last chance and that's oftentimes what great nba comes down to for being on it's like it's like college football games or nfl games who gets the last possession? Because whoever gets the last possession, you know that ball's got a great shot of going in, and it did. And it's unfortunate that Joel's shot didn't count there at the end, but but I'm just telling you, man, like the Sixers are a good team in the East. I just I need to see them prove that they can win a seven-game series. Well, breaking news uh, out of the NBA from uh, Shams Tarania says, uh, the Lakers fear LeBron James is likely to miss an extended period of time with his right foot injury. Uh, that he suffered Sunday against Dallas. He played through it. Uh, but the belief is he will be sidelined an indefinite amount of time. I, 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 is it a curse? Like, I, I don't know what you say about, about the Lakers and all these injuries. Like, how, is this, how is this not a curse? Because you've had, I mean, everybody's been hurt there this year, and now LeBron's yeah. hurt again. Yeah, I, I don't, we'll see. I mean, I think. LeBron has clearly sent the message that he like these are this is the most important stretch of games in his career and and to me I look at this and and I say hey like you know you got to figure it out whether it's whether it is you know playing through injury whether it is missing a week and then playing through injury then like it's pretty obvious now that he's going to have to play through injury yeah. so you know I, I just don't like there's limits to that you know like you have to figure out how like how much can he actually do on the injury that's the question teddy wayman the tile king of utah who by the way is now scheduled to come and do my shower teddy <laughs> i'm not gonna make a showering with teddy wayman shower. you and your mom are hillbillies <clears throat> <clears throat> teddy wayman says 76ers will falter once again in the playoffs fast in is far superior so are the bucks they really uh that really sucks for lebron see I don't think the Bucs are superior. I think, I think the Bucs with Chris Middleton coming off the bench, that was a very smart move, but the Bucs are missing now. Mm -hmm. Like Jay Crowder, I think, is knocking down threes, but the Bucs, again, I think their best attribute is they can defend. Like that Phoenix game the other night, Devin Booker turning the ball over again at the buzzer is yeah, incredibly that's... disappointing. Yeah. But I don't think the Bucks are. I don't think the Bucks are superior. I think the Bucks are showing wear and tear. Um, I I don't know, man. It, it is. I don't know, boy. Shams is saying that LeBron. It, it is being called miraculous that he was able to play through this injury. Expected to require multiple opinions. The Lakers are bracing for an absent his absence to be multiple weeks. What did he break a bone? I I don't is know, that man. What? I don't know. I mean, it's something. You hope it's a broken bone. Yeah, I mean, it's... what you hope it's not is is what you hope it it's not is like 
tearing of the muscle in the bottom of the foot. Yeah. Or, you know, like it, it's just it, – it's, note it's not being called – LeBron doesn't have an ankle injury. I think that's he has one. a foot injury. Yeah. And if it's plantar fasciitis, if it, I don't know what it is. I don't know what that looks like. But I'm telling you right now, if he's out multiple weeks, they're in real danger of missing the playoffs. Agreed. Because there's a lot of him. The only reason, the only reason that they are in the position that they're in is because of LeBron James. Yeah. It's the only reason they're as competitive as they are. It's the only reason they're winning games that he is having a historically good year. Yeah. And that's all out the window now. Yep. With this news, he's going to miss weeks. But yeah, and I think he's the one that carried them through the Anthony Davis injuries. He's the one that that is you know got them through the Russell Westbrook debacle, even though it was his idea to start that whole situation. Like yeah, you know, he's uh, it, like it's just a shame. Yeah, we'll see what that comes down to. I mean, that's all you can do at this point. Yeah, Teddy makes a good point. Teddy, a member of the program as well, uh, says when he hurt his ankle, you could see him say, "I heard it pop. It's not good." Yeah, it's yeah. a it, and it is clearly a foot thing. So what does that mean when you say you heard your foot pop? Yeah, and he know, was man. grabbing the middle of his right foot. Like it, Father Time is undefeated, man. It is, dude. It is. It is really difficult. Um, Devin Pohl says he has carried the Lakers franchise since he got there. Totally agree. Uh, T. Lawrence Gragston, without LeBron, the Lakers are done. I think they're a play-in team without him. I think they're a top six team with him. I mean, I, I think it's that simple. If And you you look at, and I don't remember, I was looking at their schedule off the top of my, uh, off the top of my head, I don't remember it, but I was looking at their schedule and you look at where the Lakers are in the standings. Yeah. Right now in the West, the Lakers are in 12th. They are one game behind the Pelicans in 10th. By the way, am I the only one who thinks it's a miracle that the Jazz are in eighth at 500? Well, and the West is super tight. I mean, Dude, seriously. Yeah, they have Memphis tomorrow. Their OKC, schedule. Their like, schedule's tough, dude. Yeah. And it is these two games on the road at Memphis, at, at OKC. But then they come home for Minnesota, Golden State, Memphis, Toronto, and New York. They have to win every one of those games. You have to. Yeah. You, can, you cannot afford to drop any all those Western Conference games, like the Golden State game is critical. Think about where Golden State is in the standings. That Minnesota game is critical in the standings. Yeah. And you look at a team like OKC, critical. They're fighting for their playoff lives, man. Yep. And it, it, like these games, these are, I'm not going to say they're elimination games, but that game on March 14th at New Orleans well, that's essentially critical. what they are. I mean, when the, I mean the, the, the West is so tight that, you know, when you're it's a two game swing. Yeah. I mean, when you're when you're losing some of these games, like it's it's just terrible for your chances. I mean, you look like you said, they're in 12th, you know, 13 and a half back. But you're only 10th or you're only three games out of the fifth spot. That's it. Like, it's not like it's a huge number. So, you know, I dude, I'm telling you, this is a big freaking deal. They sit with LeBron like, do you, are you, I don't know. It, uh, we don't really root, but I, I think you want the Lakers in the playoffs. I do. Well, it's better for the league for sure. I don't know. I know that there is a certain ferocity here in the great state of Utah against the Lakers, but I think it's better playoff <clears throat> TV. You know, like I think yeah, it you, is. You need matchups. You, you need matchups. You need like, you need like, you know, if the Lakers get into the play in, you know, you need, you know, Lakers Warriors, right? Like the seven ten matchup, you know? Like right now it's Jazz T Wolves at the eight nine. Like, you know, you need you want good matchups, but the reality of the situation is LeBron James being out, you know, an indefinite amount of time according to Shams is tough. Like that's a really, really tough break. And, you know, again, you look around the West, like I, I was watching Bones Highland last night playing against the Nuggets, like that is that kid is motivated. You know, you look at, you know, the 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 Memphis situation. Like I, I think it's really interesting that that you you you're in a position where you know John Morant like still has a lot of proving to do. I love me some Jaron Jackson Jr., but the fact is, is that club. I'm tired of hearing about how that club is young. That club's been together three four seasons now. Like they're not young. They are they are not getting the job done. 
That's the thing. So when I look but at they're, that, they're, uh, Memphis is just that team that I think everybody is rooting against Memphis. I, like I, I just Memphis is a really unlikable team right now. Like what if, if if you look at the Memphis Grizzlies and you look at the way that they play basketball, what is likable about the Memphis Grizzlies? It's not their style. It it's not their arrogance. It's not this punk basketball that they're playing. It's John Moran. <laughs> That's what's likable about Memphis because yeah. guys like Dylan Brooks, Desmond Bain has become, in my opinion, a very unlikable player with the way he treats people. Like, Completely agree. There's just not a lot to love about the Memphis Grizzlies right now. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think, you know, it's it's like the 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 Dylan Brooks jumping on Mike Conley, the, you know, last week, I think it was. Or like, you have all these situations where it's just, you know, it's just a situation where this is an unlikable team. But that's yeah. it. I still love me some John Morant. I still like when they battle it out with the Clippers or with any totally. of these really good teams in the West. Like they're a fun team to watch, but they are unlikable. They're that team right now. They're playing the villain card. So I don't know, man. I'm just telling you guys when LeBron is out indefinitely and the Lakers are not a full strength, that's a problem for the NBA. And it makes the playoff matchups not as good. Cause I think we could all agree totally. that they were rolling. They were in a really good spot. So the idea like it was it, must watch TV. Yeah. I mean, if it comes out tomorrow that LeBron is out six weeks, like that's a huge deal. It's that's, over. That's the, I mean, you're done. It's over. 